It's the next morning after the Tarkio Fire Shelter Deployment Staff Ride. We're back in the Missoula Conference Room where the Managing the Unexpected in Wildland Fire Operations workshop is being held. It is now time for the Staff Ride's integration phase. There's, there's been a lot, of, a lot of talk about the power lines. And can you, can you comment on how the power line situation influenced your strategy and tactics? How the power lines influenced our strategy and tactics uh, was that we had to come up with a specific plan to deal with the power lines. Um, did that modify our strategy and tactics toward the fires that were there? Uh, not in my opinion. Um, and I'll, I'll explain that. On most large fires, I, I use what I'll call as a box theory. And, and I look at trying to first contain fires within a box. You, you try to establish a a uh, side of the box and make sure that box is solid. Uh, so our first side of the box with these incidents was the highway. Um, it had slopped over the highway in a few places, but the uh, initial attack forces had contained those. So our first in intention was to stop it from crossing the highway and the river. So that was our initial efforts. The next efforts, if you're thinking about a box, is then you want to try to build the sides of the box and then you try to put the lid on the box. Well, we had the bottom side of the box, the two sides of the box, and we're working on the lid of the box when we had the deployment. The fact that we had power lines out there in no way, shape, or form modified that strategy. What it did do, though, is that we ended up spending about a half a million bucks and actually had an aircraft, a retardant aircraft, specifically assigned to the incident, and our plan was if the fire made a run at the power line was to try to use aerial aircraft to cool the fire down to where it wouldn't actually melt the line. Um, and we were best case scenario hoping the smoke wouldn't arc it and shut it down. Uh, what happened was when this fire made its run we got about one load of retardant down and a couple bucket drops on it um, and, the, and it did arc from the smoke but it did not melt. Did our strategy and tactics cause that? Heck no. I mean, the, the retardant that we threw at it and the water we threw at it had absolutely no bearing whatsoever on, on the fire behavior that afternoon as it came, came toward the power line, but that was our plan. Um, there was no way we had time at all uh, to try to get in and actually do the fuel reduction work that would have been necessary to have effectively dealt with the fire behavior next to that power line keeps coming back to me that uh, the division soup on that fire that day was, that was his first assignment. Task force leader, that was his first assignment for that particular area. Where was the team's divisions at that day? I mean, that was going to be where it went down that day. I mean, that was, you know, you had a spot that, that if it wasn't held that day, it was going to, it's going to cause a lot of problems. And then that whole division there, a lot going on on that division, um, you know, and I could say we had a division soup that that um, never been on that ground. I, I won't say never been on that ground. He did make some right around the fire kind of broad perspective the day before. And then, you know, and then he was put on what I call the hottest part of the fire. And then you had a task force that really never saw the, the uh, spot until the inversion lifted. Um, so it's hard to bring people all in and make it happen, but the way you mitigate that is, is I'd say, the team concept of you know your divisions, you know those folks real well, putting them on the hottest part of the fire um, and let them run that for you and let the other ones kind of work in there. Was there an opportunity to do that? I wasn't there, I don't know, but I just asked them kind of have that addressed. Great, Mylon, great question. Uh, we wrestle with that as an incident management team a lot. Um, and I'd answer it a couple of ways. Uh, the, the first way is that, remember back to my box description. Um, to me, that was not the most important part of the fire. The most important part of that fire for me was the first leg of the box we put in. Okay, one of the things I really hate to do is back up um, on an incident. So the most important part of that fire is actually the first leg of the box. The second most important part of the fire, is, or the second legs of the box, and the least most important part of the fire is the one we're trying to complete. 
now, but the one we're trying to complete, as you stated, is the most risky. And the trick there for me is, and this is what I've been wrestling with, is okay, if things start going gunny bag, leave. And what's interesting, and you've heard the conflict uh, a little bit, is you, you had people that day saying, hey, we need, we need to leave, but you also had people saying, no, we're okay. Um, we can pick this thing up. Let's stay. Now, it wasn't me saying that. That was the people out there on the fire. So that's what I've been wrestling with is, okay, at what point in time do we need to make the decision to go ahead and leave with those people that we've just thrown together? Because that's going to happen every single time. And, and how do we make that occur safely with 800 people, knowing that we've got multiple escape routes that are out in tough ground and safety zones that are designed for us to re-engage from? Uh, that's where I end up with it. It's really important that we find ways to, to bring this, these principles and this training to the people that we work with and who work for us. And you know, I was thinking about this yesterday that the next time one of these workshops is presented, I'm really hoping that I can send um, like people from like three levels of my organization to this training, you know, from the bottom, the middle, and, and the top to this. And those people then will be able to help me disseminate these principles throughout our organization because this, at least so far, has been something that's really tied a lot of the other really high-value high value training together. I guess what I'm going to take home with me from this conference, uh, one of the people in our group the other day mentions, you know, after 20-some years and uh, their career, they finally feel like they have the opportunity to create positive changes. And it's just kind of dawning on me, I guess, that even at our level uh, as ground pounders, that this is our opportunity. And it may take a decade for the fruits of our labor to show, but I guess, you know, if we can start from the bottom the people that will come to follow us in the future will already have those principles uh, to work with. Having had the pleasure to be a, uh, a part of uh, uh, the Managing the Unexpected workshop since the, the first, I'm still struggling with our ability as an organization to address the very first principle. And our group uh, discussed that at length too uh, the other day. And that is a preoccupation with failure. In other words, our ability to actually get our arms around that. And think about this, right out, of the, right out of our handouts here. People who operate and manage in highly reliable organizations assume that each day will be a bad day and act accordingly. These systems have been characterized as consisting of collective bonds among suspicious individuals. To consistently entertain the thought that we have missed something. And I, I'm still struggling uh, with us as an organization to be able to think that way. And uh, that's part of the link in the uh, HRO that we're missing. So I just want to say a couple things. I'm not in the fire business. I was a long time ago. But um, I want to say thank you to the Forest Service for um, being willing to share lessons learned with everybody who wants to participate. Um, it, it's very meaningful. Um, so, uh, kind of following on this preoccupation with failure and what, what some of our folks were talking about is weak signals. You know, I'm sort of fascinated with what are those weak signals in your day-to-day -day organization or your day-to-day -day operations, you know, and, and I think it was uh, the Helitech guy that said something yesterday about organized chaos. This is always organized chaos. Um, and and so where do you sort of start to draw the line and how do you sort of start to use those signals? So I think that we're, we've all got this big, big, big challenge to say in organized chaos or in day-to-day -day operations that are not organized chaos, what are my weak signals? What are my weak signals that things are starting to go haywire? And what are my opportunities to do anything differently about it? You know, I, I kind of want this, yesterday I was looking for this, this easy answer. Um, operations, the spot fire wasn't getting the air ops that he wanted, there were some communications breakdowns, there was people not knowing what was going on with the other division. But, but seriously, at what point do you say, this is still okay, let's keep fighting the fire, or okay, you know what, this is no longer okay, we need to really change our strategy or we need to do something differently, and, and what, are those, what are those things that you can do when you're in the midst of the organized chaos? So um, 
so I'm really fascinated with that, and I'm, and I'm working on how I bring that back to, to my area. So thank you. I think what made the most impression on me this with the staff ride was uh, don't fall in love with the plan. And, um, you know, we have these teams in place to give us good plans, and we rely on them because we're out there in an unsafe environment, and if we didn't rely on them, we might not want to go out there. But on the other hand, you have to have it in the back of your mind that you can't be in love with that plan, and you have to be willing to abandon it and do something different. And even though, in a way, it was a failure in the plan because that they had to deploy, and they had to deploy in a place that they weren't expecting. So it could be looked at as a failure. What I loved about the staff ride was we got to um, experience a success in the fact that we saw these people just get right down to the business of getting themselves protected. And I was on the 30 mile staff ride where that wasn't apparent, that people got right down to the business of getting themselves protected. And so it's good to have an opportunity to learn the steps you do need to take and see the outcome of success. I'd like to take on HRO principle number two. I think when we have firefighters showing up on a fire, they're there as guests of the host agencies. And as guests, they're deserving to receive the, the very best of intelligence, briefing, fuels information, fire weather forecasts, fire behavior forecasts. And, uh, and I think our very tradition and culture sets up a, a situation where perhaps uh, if things are going well, it's a very simple, simplified kind of approach to interpretation. Uh, people are given stuff and then they go to work and perform. Um, what I'm going to say next is based on a staff ride down at Battlement three weeks ago. 1976 fire, three people died. We were also at South Canyon with Eric Kipke where 14 people died and also what we saw yesterday. And I think in so many of our fire events where we have serious, serious problems, uh, the simple giving of information to firefighters just did not happen. People at Battlement and at, at South Canyon were not briefed on the fact that, battle, or that the Gamble's Oak is a life-threatening fuel type. They simply were not given that information. Uh, at South Canyon, there was a very, very excellent red flag forecast for a cold front and, and high winds to come that afternoon of 30 to 40 or 50 miles an hour. That forecast, for very difficult reasons to understand, simply was not sent out to the firefighters. And I think to bring in this HRO principle of, of really seeking and requiring complex interpretations of complex events is not just a function of dispatch or the fire behavior uh, analyst, or the fire weather meteorologist. It's, it's everybody's responsibility. And, and I guess what I learned most yesterday when we learned from Tammy that a forecast was given, uh, a forecast was made that afternoon of the 10th to update the situation, but it never went out to the fire line. So I, I guess the bottom line for me in this HRO principle number two that is that you should expect to receive certain kinds of information, but if it's not forthcoming, you have an incumbent responsibility as a hotshot crew from the Helena or the Lolo or crew from wherever, say, hey, wait a minute, time out. Where's the briefing on these fuels? Uh, what is the situation on this red slash? How extensive is it? Where is it? What are the fire behavior implications? Or where is this fire weather update? that I really want to have. And so I guess uh, to really measure up to the HRO principle of complex interpretations, it's just, it's just incumbent on everybody out there. If something isn't there, if it's not present, if you have a gut feeling, if your intuition's telling you, hey, this doesn't feel quite right, boy, get on the horn and, and, and demand as a guest of that host agency that I want to know this and ensure that you get it. This third annual Managing the Unexpected workshop on high reliability organizing and wildland fire operations, including the learning and insights from its Tarkio staff ride, has provided its participants with new knowledge and tools. Hopefully, now, these fire management practitioners are introducing and honing their high reliability organizing skills back on their home units in a variety of fire management operations. 
for there is no question that we all need to do whatever we can to ensure that this season, and through all future fire seasons, our agencies are successfully and safely implementing this country's high-risk wildland fire programs. And now, thanks to the Wildland Fire Lessons Learned Center, you too have joined those who traveled back to the Tarkio fire site. You can better appreciate why we all must constantly be striving to improve our wildland fire programs by exploring and implementing the principles of high reliability organizing. Please help us spread the all-important HRO message. <laughs>